so this so this is a true story and it's one of the weirdest stories that I have to tell and it's central to my career as a magician and quite personal in the sense that this experience or this this piece of knowledge, if you will, this arcanum that I'm going to talk about now, uh, relates to an experience that I had at the sort of turning point or crossroads of my life as a magician, which occurred in 2003, uh, shortly prior to the founding of the, the IBA system, the first of the IBA system counts, which is the Mercury count. As you know, I have been inspired to create, to craft an orrery of extraplanetary calendars since 2003. That's almost 20 years now. And there were some events that led up to this. And this particular event in that I'm going to talk about today is, it has opened up a question, an idea, uh, in an extraordinary way that remains open. It remains unsolved. But in some ways, it's at the heart of my magical experience, and I want to share it with, with you. Um, at this stage in the course, assuming that you're in my course, um, it's somewhat technical. Uh, there is a degree of Kabbalistic skill that is required to reproduce these results, uh, and I almost chose to to keep this private. I decided to to make this video um, because at this time on the path of the Empress, we're talking about love, and the the core of this is is love, and. It's a mystery involving a secret word uh, that that I learned through a vision, uh, through a um, through a transmission, if you will. It did not come to me through a corporeal uh, route of transmission, and of course, at first I thought, okay, you know, whatever, it's just a thing. But as time went on, I realized it was more and more and more and more significant. And it, it revealed things that I couldn't have possibly known uh, at the time. So I'll leave it for you guys to decide what the status of this, um, this is. But, and I have alluded to it throughout the course. But now I'm going to disclose how I received what I believe to be the ritual name of Rome. So, okay. So, in uh, 2002, I was working on um, the path working. I was using the thought thick. I was using Crowley, Crowley's method, but my friends and I would meet on Saturdays and we would do a meditation. We did it for 22 Saturdays in a row while we were living in Ottawa. And there were three of us who were there at every single one of these. And sometimes there were more and sometimes there were less. But we, we did a, a path working of 22 paths of the, the Crowleyan tarot, the, the Thoth deck. And the outcome of this experience was interesting. On the day that we finished, when we, uh, when we path worked the Fool, there was a great big rainbow, which we saw from Parliament Hill, from the Peace Tower, in fact. And there was a moment shortly following this experience in which I decided to see what happens if you turn the letters of the tree, uh, of, of the, the tree of life, the letter assignments that we all know, turn them upside down. Now, this is something that, um, this is something that the, uh, the magician where is it? Oh, I put it there. Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, this is something that 
Aleister Crowley's protege did, uh, a fellow named Charles Stanfield Jones. And um, Jones, or Frater Achad, as he was known, is said to have rearranged the tree, the, the paths on the tree of life and basically put them backwards. Uh, so Aleph is down on the 31st path and bet. Um, I'm not sure there's, there's some nuance to his system that I never quite followed because what I simply did was reverse the letters. Uh, and what I did was called Athbash. I did not know at the time that it was Athbash. I replaced Aleph with Ta, Bet with Shin, and I just, I just, you, I just Athbashed the whole tree. Athbash is, of course, the um, pairing of Hebrew letters. I learned later that this is what the procedure was called. Um, so I Athbashed the whole tree, and then I noticed, okay, hold on, these pairs, Aleph and Bet, uh, Aleph and Shin, sorry. Aleph and Ta, Bet and Shin, and so on, give us the uh, tarot trump totals of 21. And I've spoken about this extensively in the course, and uh, I've talked about the ripple field and the labyrinth, and this is all completely tied into this experience where I, in a kind of a moment, realized that the, the Thoth deck was no longer for me, and that I was uh, looking for a deck that, um, that placed justice in the middle, and um, had this ability to uh, produce this ripple field, which I didn't call it at that point, but uh, had this, this radial symmetry. And uh, this is the, the moment where I feel like I contacted the Mott Aeon. So what is the Mott Aeon? The Crowleyan perspective is that our time frame or reality is has been experienced in these ages the age of isis which is the matriarchal age of humanity the age of osiris which was the patriarchal age of humanity and the age of horus which is just newly dawned which is the um the age of the crown crowned and conquering child uh and it, it curly understood it as starting in 1904 which incidentally is when Einstein first published his theory of relativity. And so there's some credence to be had that there was a massive transformation at this point um, in our understanding of the universe. And so this is the framework from which I was working, but what I also knew is that according to, to Crowley, there was a an age of Mat, which is the goddess of justice. Uh, to come after this, 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 the, the age of Horus, the age of um, this, this great struggle and strife, um, and there was an age of, of balance and restoration to come. And then there was even an image in uh, Libra four eighteen, the vision and the voice, in which Crowley scribed the Enochian ethers, in which he saw a great lion consuming civilizations, and way in the background is this armored figure holding the scales, and. Um, and he sort of said, oh, that's Mott, but that won't happen for 2,000 years, so don't worry about it. Now, of course, <laughs> there have been other individuals, the first of which was, was Frater Akkad, to declare actually that, that the age of Mott has currently landed. So, so basically, he said, I forget what exactly what date, but he declared the Aeon of Mott. And Mott... So the Mott age represents a, um, a coming to, to balance, a coming to, to justice, if you will, a coming to peace. Now, if you look at aeons not as these fixed spans of time, but as almost kind of um, domains or regions uh, of, of, of temporality, through which we travel, which is essentially what the aeons were in the Gnostic system, which had 30 aeons or stages, um, then you can understand how some people would move forward or backward. So, so from the point of view of a strict Crowleyan, we are now in the age of Horus, um, you can see the point of view. Uh, the overall vibe in the world is Horusian. But as individuals, it becomes possible to be part of the Isis age or be part of the the the, the Assyrian age or 
uh, to, to represent or connect with the Mott Age. And so this was a moment where I feel like I connected to the era of Ma'at. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't gone back. Uh, I, I, I've been highly influenced by this energy. And uh, I made some major changes in my life, not the least of which being I left Ottawa and I moved to Newfoundland, where I lived for, for 12 years. But uh, let me get back to the story. This is a bit of a, a long video and it's a bit of a long story, but uh, I hope it gives you guys some idea of what inspires me, what I'm working with, and um, this extraordinary mystery that's fallen into my lap and into our laps because it is a big part of this course and what created it and what has inspired my entire work with calendars. So, <laughs> so um, a little bit of extra um, detail. One of the things we were looking at is, because um, my interest in calendars went several years before this, this event in 2003, um, we have been looking at the New Age Mayan calendar, which at the time was um, focused on 2012, 20, December 21st, 2012. So there was an idea that, well, there was a vulgar idea that this was going to be the end of the world, but um, in reality, the, the, the players in this movement understood it as an, an end and a beginning and understood it as um, a, a moment in which uh, our understanding of time would, would change. And of course, um, criticisms can be brought to bear on this, this, uh, um, this movement. And there was, there's by no means a uniform set of, uh, of players. There were several, several different um, claimants to when that date was, and then there were the living Maya themselves, who are the um, Zapatistas in Chiapas, and uh, and they have their genuine alarm count that remains in play. But um, at this time, the, the the Mayan calendar was of deep fascination um, as a an avenue for creating a temporality that uh, would be ecological and would be long term and would be superior to the um, continuous grind of the time is money mentality that seems to be generated by the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> so with this in mind, the moment that I had of, of reversal, of, of exit from the Horus Age, of entrance into this Matian energy was a moment that connected me very strongly with the idea of, um, of a future that we can communicate with and connect to and uh, through action draw ourselves towards a future in which uh, time has a very different character. And during this period, the last few months of my stay in, in Ottawa, I, I learned some things. I read a book by uh, Kenneth Grant, who is a um, quite a famous magician, also um, uh, a prolific writer on, on things weird. Um, and uh, influenced obviously by Crowley. Um, and he wrote a book, I believe it was um, called Cults of the Shadow, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, and he spoke a little bit about Frater Akkad uh, and the declaration of the Aeon of Mutt. And what I learned from that is that Frater Akkad declared that the word of the age of Mutt was ma ion and um, ma ion is the first two and the last two letters of the word manifestation uh, and um, I did not find this extraordinarily convincing uh, I think sometimes there is a, a very a looseness to the magical mind that can draw intense conclusions from what would appear to be fairly uh, flippant uh, word games. 
And yet there is some profound depth that can come out of some of these these words. And, and, and perhaps at the time I didn't have an appreciation um, to the same degree that I do now that there can be discoveries unlocked that come out of the unconscious, if you want to call it, or the deep, that defy linear explanation. And this is an example of it. So I was I was preparing to um, pack my, my, my stuff together and get out and go to Newfoundland. And I was doing some gematria because this is one of the things I do. Uh, so playing with numbers and letters and uh, playing with the name Ma'ayon. Ma and of course Ma'ayon... You would spell it if you transliterated it into Hebrew, uh, Mem, Aleph, uh, Yod, Ayin, Nun. Uh, and um, the idea of an English Kabbalah, of course, has been discussed extensively. I don't tend to use English Kabbalah, so I'm not going to go there. Um, lots and lots and lots of different versions and different systems. It's almost staggering and dizzying. It's like this labyrinth. And, and, and I think you really have to pick carefully through, through when you're working with Dematra because it's very easy to just get lost in a thicket of um, superficialities. And, uh, and at a certain point, I walked away from it entirely. But coming back years and years later, I see the certain, certain gems came up. And this is one of them because uh, I was thinking a lot about the the Maya, and I was thinking about Ma and the Hebrew name Ya, which is uh, Ma would be a, a feminine and Ya would be uh, a masculine. So I thought to myself, Ma Ya Ion, Maya Ion. And the moment this occurred to me, the moment I, I, I said this word, Maya Ion, <laughs> and I calculated its number, and uh, in in uh, English, uh, in English gematria, I think it was a linear version that I used, which is just A is one and B is two, or it could could have also been what's known as the New Aeon English Kabbalah, which is just basically English permuted by eleven. You don't need to know that, but in English, it was the value of Maya Ion was ninety three, which is um, a key number. It means love and it means will. But in Hebrew, Maya Ion is 186, which is 93 times 2. So there's this triangle, this little triangle of 93s that pop out of this spell. It's a spell, right? You know, this is what we're doing when we're spelling. So it, like, opened this little triangle. And the moment that happened, I received a magic square. And the magic, I received the word Manu. Amun Numa Unam. It just like, um, I can't even describe it. Uh, like a voice in my head. Like, a, or, or my, I won't say my head, a voice in my heart. Just expressing this, this word. Um, Manu Amun Numa Unam. And this is a magic square. And I'll show you. I haven't. So this is a magic square, and it's a simple fourfold magic square. Fourfold magic squares are the easiest, of course, to um, to do. So you can see that it has a fourfold symmetry, right? It's a palindrome that reads Manu Amun Numa Unam in four different directions. One, two, three, and four. And very masculine energy to this word. So I, um, I felt very compelled by this. I felt like this was uh, a key. And uh, my story goes on. 
I moved to Newfoundland. I um, I shortly after in that year, I, I, I developed the the Thoth count, which is the Mercury calendar, which began the whole process, and I launched it in on December nineteenth. 2003, which was the first mercurial year. Believe it or not, I have counted uh, 76 of these years <laughs> um, tracking uh, Mercury around the sun. And 76 Mercury years ago, the Ibis system, Orrery, uh, was born. And Orrery is a uh, basically a model of the solar system. And the Ibis system is a calendrical orrery it's an orrery of calendars it's as if each planet has a calendar and the calendar um, is a way of living and meditating and focusing energy in different ways and there are um, a uh, there's a whole system a whole solar system that uh, that that comes together and this is obviously connected to the hermetic maxim as above so below the microcosm is the macrocosm of course what differentiates this from perhaps other systems is that it is heliocentric. Um, so, right, so I said the word Maya Ion while in a intense Martian kind of frame of mind, uh, if you will, and um, received this word. Uh, I shortly learned, I, I, I met someone um, incidentally um, who introduced me to uh, the work of, of Nima, uh, where did I put that? Should be somewhere close. Anyway, the work of Nima. This is by uh, total synchronicity, total coincidence. Met someone who introduced me to Nima. Uh, Nima is uh, is also a person who has um, worked with the 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 Mott energy. She she did something a little different. She created something called the Horus Mott Lodge, which. I've mentioned before, she's got a really lovely book that I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I don't see it immediately. It's somewhere. Mm -hmm. But um, it's called Mott Magic. It's actually quite erudite. And it's a philosophy of magic that's very future-oriented. It's very much about... And if you see my methodology, it's, it's exceptionally Mott Magic. Um, it incorporates elements of paganism, elements of... Um, uh, of um, Chaos magic elements of Thelema and uh, and elements of um, multiple traditions. It is a very eclectic, uh, and it's still around. Nima has uh, has gone to the other another level of existence at this point, but um, but the Horus Mott Lodge still exists, and I did eventually become involved with it, um, but um, or at least peripherally. But the philosophy. Uh, is, 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 is a major contributor to how I work as a magician. Right, so I had this word Manu, and um, as time came on, went on, uh, I played with this word. I received another word, which was um, Amor. And I realized that I could do the same thing with Amor that I did with Manu. Amor, Maro, Oram, Roma spells. Um, spells another one of these squares and you know it turns out that i am definitely not the first person to think of this um there's uh if you do some research online um you will find that you will find um plenty of this square and it is, in fact, here's an example of this square. I'm going to show you better versions of this in a bit, but uh, but I, I I want to save them because it's a bit of a you know build up of of tension. And right, so so the the Amor square is, is definitely something <laughs> that has been done before, and there's graffiti in Pompeii and. Uh, and so on. I didn't know any of this. I just came up with it. Um, and so I did the gematria and I realized that Manu is 97. Of course I knew that. 
and um, Amor is um, 200, uh, sorry, rather 311. 311. Uh, this gives us a total of 408. So being who I am and with my uh, profound interest in uh, the formula of Abrahadabra and the number 418, I uh, immediately realized that these two squares could form as like lobes, if you will, or wings. And if there was a central body, if there was a central body, then uh, you could, uh, that was, that had the value of 10, then Amor Anu, or I had Maro, or was sorry, Amun and 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 Amor. Um, if the, if you added ten to them, you'd have four hundred and eighteen. What's more is if you added ten to them in a way that had three letters, um, you would add uh, you you would make them worth four hundred and eighteen with the pattern four letters. Three letters, four letters, which is the same pattern as Abrahad Abra. So there is a beauty to that. And also, uh, Had in the middle of Abrahad Abra is worth uh, 10. So, so what this became was an equivalent to Abrahad Abra, but it had uh, this feature, which is that the magic squares on the two wings. Uh, themselves would infinitely um, expand, right? So you can take the word Amor and make a magic square of it, and then you can make four of those magic squares, and it becomes a cube. And eight of those cubes becomes a bigger cube. So actually, each one of these has the ability to scale to infinity. So what you have is this word uh, that I came up with at this point. Um, this could have been three, four, five years later. Um, Amor, um, Manu, uh, Manu had Numa or Manu, Manu had Amor. See, at this point, I had not did, I had not actually settled on what the word was. Um, it seemed to have many different valences, many different possibilities. It could turn this way or that way. It could be shaped in many different ways. Um, and. At this stage, I substituted the word had in the middle to give the value of 10. So it was Amor or Manu had Amor or whatever, whatever it was at that time. And I meditated on it and I worked with it. And it led me to another discovery, maybe five, six years later. This is kind of slow release. <laughs> uh, I had been working with a group online um, in a place called abrahadabra.com and we were talking about this kind of stuff and this kind of philosophy this is where i learned the twin star um and i ran i ran this through the twin star and uh but it occurred to me that actually instead of had in the middle aka aleph ket aleph made a lot more sense it was symmetrical and it placed the letter Chet directly in the center of the formula. So you had this formula, which quickly became Amor Aha Unam. Uh, amor, love, uh, Aha, turns out is the root, the Hebrew root meaning brother, brotherhood. Um, there is some, you know, <laughs> this isn't high grammar here. This is a little, um, uh, this is uh, this is magic. So, um, amor, of course, is Latin for love. Aha, brother, and unam is one. So you could say love is the brother of unity. That is that is how you could define uh, this this word. Love is the brother of unity. Uh, having the chet smack dab in the center is a move that creates a very interesting effect. So Kabbalah is very dynamic. 
the letters do not stay the same. They can transform, they can expand, they can contract. And if you remember that the, um, remember when we talked about how yod, uh, spelt yod yud dalif equals, takes the 10 of yod and makes it worth 20. Yod, um, yod uh, va dalif is 20. So that is like kaf, which means open palm, and yod means fist. Spelling yod in full is like opening the hand. So that is one of the examples of the dynamic nature of Hebrew gematria. Another example is that chet example, um, chet meaning fence, when expanded to full, chet uh, yud, tet, uh, has the value of 418. So what Amor HaUnam allowed to happen is that it allows the formula to be reborn from its own heart. So for example, um, if we take, I'll explain a little bit more of this um, in, in, in a bit. This, this in a way summarizes all the use of gematria in, uh, in the course so far. Uh, but here's the chet in the center. Here's the acha, meaning brother, and amor unam, expressed as full squares. So you can see this as four utterances of amor aha unam, Maro uh, Numa Uram Amun Roma Manu. These are all legitimate forms of expression of this singular word that has many different modes, and um, this Chet expands to be valued at 418, which, as we know, is the value of Abrahadabra, of Pallas Athena, and of Makashana, as well as of Rahur. So. Um, and here we have Maya Ion. Um, 186 is 93 and 93, which is uh, Agape and Talima, which have a, between them a total of 11 letters, which is interesting. Um, okay, so we've got this formula that seems to fountain out continuously from its own heart, in addition to expanding on both its lows. It's an extremely dynamic formula. But what is it, and what does it do? Uh, I knew that it was powerful. It was creating these amazing structures as I meditated on it, but I didn't quite understand what it was. So here's another example of how to lay this thing out. Um, re remembering that every one of these utterances can uh, expand into a full infinite cube or square. But uh, I've laid this out in a way. Um, what I've done is I've used a low shoe. So I have... So I have used a low shoe with um, this section as five. And uh, so we amor, maro, oram, ro, um, amor, maro, oram, roma. So that's one, two, three, four, skipping five. And then uh, unam, numa, amon, and um, manu. And what this does very interestingly is it pairs up the two lobes. So you can say manu, aha, amor here with a chet. So this is 418 maro aha amun, this is 418 numa aha oram, this is 418, and amun aha roma, this is 418. Now, uh, I have been talking about the um, Lakashina formula as well over this course. Here is a eightfold star, mem, aleph, k, ket, aleph, shin, aleph, Nun he. So this, in a way, resonates to the entire structure. So Makashina <laughs> rides uh, rides the Amor uh, Unum formula, and Abrahadabra, as we have seen, forms. Um, triangular arrays such as this. So where is this, all this going, these, these words and numbers the dance and create structures and lattices and um, all sorts of um, funky things. Um, <laughs> and where, where did it come from? Was it something I just thought up? I mean, one, one, one would 
do well to just say, okay, this is just funkiness in Pete's brain. And that's what I thought it was. However, in 2013, I made a friend who is a, um, a numismatist and a, a student of, of ancient Roman history. And I learned some things I never knew before. And one of them is that in ancient Roman history, there has said to have been a name of Rome, a ritual name of Rome that was kept secret. And the reason it was kept secret is because one of the methodologies that the Roman Empire used when it went to other lands is it would learn the name of the tutelary deity of their cities and it would petition that deity to join the empire. It would offer that deity um, uh, um, gifts in order to draw it into uh, the Roman Empire. So it had this methodology of essentially converting these other gods into its own um, its own system. And for that reason, the name of Rome itself was kept secret because they did not want this methodology applied to themselves. Okay, so what is the secret name of Rome? Well, we don't entirely know, but what we do know is that there was at least one person executed for uh, for for publishing what he claimed was the name of Rome and what he, what this gentleman claimed and you can find this information if you look this up online um, uh, I don't know the name off the top of, of my head but it is there and um, uh, you'll, you'll find it um, with a quick Google search uh, this gentleman suggested that the, the secret name of, of, of Rome was Amor. And so in my conversation with this new friend, um, this numismatist, he mentioned that and I just suddenly kind of got tingled. So I was like, hold on. Yeah, <laughs> I know this word. And, um, and what's more, I understand entirely how it would be this, this, this powerful structure building array. Of course, um, in my understanding, Amor is just one half of it. So, <laughs> so if if we were to entertain this somewhat fanciful tale that what Amor Ahaunam represents is a secret name with the power to unlock <laughs> the Roman uh, code, if you will, then um, then we would have to accept that Amor is not the entire name, is that is, is one one half of that name. Okay, I'm happy with that. Uh, I am not making a historical claim, but uh, I am entertaining. I, 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 we have a word that has these um, extraordinary dynamics to it. Uh, and then we have um, we have um, this incredible synchronicity. So what more is there um, to it? Well, it turns out there's quite a bit. Um, so let's look at what comes out of the full spelling, right? So we've got Amor Maro Oram Roma Aha Unam Numa Amon Manu. If we go deeper, we will find quite a bit more. Um, and this is why I said at the outset, this is a kind of an ongoing mystery um, that, that, that becomes more compelling the deeper the deeper I explore it. So Amor, love. We know that. What does Maro mean? Maro is <laughs> the cognomen of Virgil. Maro means outstanding poet. So Virgil was called Maro. And Virgil, by the way, set, um, you know, helped set up the, uh, the Augustus emperor myth um, by writing the Aeneid, which places uh, Rome as essentially the successors of Troy. It's the idea that Aeneas fled Troy after the Greeks destroyed it and then um, founded Rome. Um, so Maro is a title. It basically, it was his nickname, and it basically means outstanding poet. Um, Oram means coast, limit, frontier, or edge, and Roma, of course, means 
Rome, and it comes from the name of Romulus. And there were two brothers, Romulus and Remus. And so this is getting interesting. Um, love is the brother of unity, amor aha unum. Um, and uh, since there's no real grammar in this square, we can say something like um, love is the poetry that draws the frontiers of Rome. Just in this one square. Um, this is the Amor square. It's um, potent with meaning. Now, if we look at the Unam square, the Amor square has a softness to it. It has love, it has coastlines, um, it has poetry. The Unam square is filled with extremely masculine um, energy. So unam numa amun manu. <laughs> unam meaning uh, unity. Uh, numa, it was the second king of Rome. And here's the thing. So numa succeeded, uh, numa succeeded uh, uh, Romulus. And numa... There's some interesting stories about Numa. And in particular, Numa had um, a nymph who he would speak to named Agira, who gave him many, many, many secrets. And he wrote these in the books of Numa. And the books of Numa were buried with him only about 500 years later. This is a fact of, this is on the record. Um, these books were unearthed in an earthquake and the Senate had to decide what to do with the books of Numa. So what did they do? They decided that they were too dangerous and they had to be destroyed. So they destroyed the books of Numa. The secrets, the secrets buried in Numa. Uh, they are the secret bits buried with Numa. Numa Pompilius. Um, of course, a counter narrative runs that says, well, that's what they told the public, <laughs> but in fact, those books were secretly preserved by the pontifices, the calendar priests. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, so we have the name Numa, and we have this story of um, the, the, the secrets of Rome. Perhaps the name of Rome is one of the, um, the secrets that was buried with Numa. And as we know, a name, is, uh, a name isn't just a designation or even a description. Um, words of power, magical words, in a way, are their own reference. So abracadabra doesn't have to mean anything to do something. It, it, in, in its geometries, it produces these structures. Similarly, amoraha unam does stuff. It is a dynamic um, living entity. And so um, in that respect, it, 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 a word like this very much has the power to um, to found a way of thinking because it involves producing structures, organizational structures. Uh, so it is very possible that the uh, that the actual structure is in the name itself. So we have Numa. Um, incidentally, another city with a secret name is Bangkok. Bangkok's secret name is the longest name in the world. It's insane. It's longer than Khan Phra Port Wingus Gagak Lin Trono Clan Tresilio Gogogok which is in Wales. It's the second longest place name in the world. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the Bangkok one. Um, but, um, okay. And then you have Amun. <laughs> Amun is, of course, Egyptian god. And Amun was made equivalent to Zeus um, by the Greeks. Um, Zeus Amun. Um, so the, the king of the gods, the, the, the hierarchical master. And finally, Manu uh, is both hand in 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 Latin and also the first king of India um, as written out in in the Sanskrit Vedas uh, and who who, who established uh, I think the first law code so the, the law code of Manu uh, so this is deep old-school um, masculine energy so why do we talk about this now on the path of the Emperor and the Empress well as you can see the Emperor is all about structure and the empress is about um love and about flow we have a word here amoraha unam which you know, go back to this 
which brings the two together. So Amor is the empress, Anunam is uh, the emperor. So Amor Ha'unam is uh, an extraordinary magic word that uh, creates worlds. Uh, as you can see, we have I've 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 made this um, this uh, diagram or this kind of set of contemplations. So we got Maya Ion. By the way, this 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 doesn't stop. This this gets more interesting. So we got Maya Ion, um, which gave me um, this 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 seed of this word, uh, which now appears to be a fairly decent candidate for the secret word of secret name of Rome. Uh, I have also written Pallas Athena, which is an 11 letter word that also totals 418 in Greek. And, and interestingly enough, Pallas Athena was the um, inventor of the chariot, as I mentioned. Uh, the chariot is assigned to Chet. So we, uh, but, but Pallas Athena was also the tutelary goddess of Athens. <laughs> And Roma is the tutelary goddess of Rome. And um, when I asked um, a classicist about, you know, what, what are Athena's characteristics, um, Athena is uh, an urbanizer. Uh, Athena essentially has the powers of the other gods. She's got the, um, she's got, she's got the Aegis of, of, her, uh, of Zeus, uh, the thunderbolt and the shield. She's got uh, the wings of Hermes. She's got uh, she she she's got all these attributes of the other gods that have been kind of perfected or urbanized. She's a uh, she is this this entity that um, that represents almost the, the perfection or intelligentization <laughs> intelligentization you like that uh, of of um, of these these raw forms. So she makes the ship or the bridle. Uh, you know the these ways of riding the wildness, the domesticating. So she's a she's a goddess in the sense of domesticating wild energies, and she is born um, fully formed out of her father's head. And I, I believe I showed how um, this this could be described at one point. I'll show it again. Um, the Tetractus is the four letter name of God. Um, or sorry, the the, the t t yeah. The um, the tetractus is 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 the, the 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 triangle of one plus two plus three plus four and the four letter name of God can be hung upon it. Here is an example of a little thing that I did uh, where I show um, the name Zeus in these lines. You can't really see it here. So it's, no, you can't see that. But anyway, what I have is Pallas Athena being produced in the, the 11 stages, and then Zeus being produced in the four stages. Um, so it suggests how Athena might spring fully armed in armor of her father's head. So this 11-fold uh, strategic emerges out of fourfoldness immediately, like this emanated field. Um, Amoraha Unam represents this in space. It's this sudden kind of emergence of intelligence structure uh, in a non-linear fashion. It just suddenly <laughs> expresses itself <laughs> like my son. Um, it's an emergence of a non-linear uh, uh, expression. But um, All right, so I'm going to wrap this um, towards its conclusion, but... Uh, you have so you have these two goddesses. Interestingly enough, um, Athena and um, and Roma, who who play very similar roles in relation to their cities. And when the word Abrahadabra was uh, proposed, four hundred eighteen Abrahadabra by 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 Aleister Crowley, introduced in the Book of the Law, uh, it had all these resonances resonances with um, aspects of his life. So, for example, he found that his house in Scotland called Bolskine House could be made to, to, to total 418. And he found all these other things. Um, and, and he did quite a bit of work with 418 and with Abrahadabra. Um, but one of the things that he wrote about in, in um, Magic and Theory and Practice is that Abrahadabra, he called it the Holy Grail, the Cup of Babylon. Abrahadabra is the Cup of Babylon. 
So Babylon, there's another urban goddess. So for 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 Crowley's um, and and this now this is this is Crowley's apocalypticism. The horror of Babylon, of course, is from the the uh, the Book of Revelations. But um, the point is is that he equated Abrahadabra or 418 with with Babylon, uh, and of course Babylon with uh, Babylon. Um, And so you have this fascinating kind of little synchronicity, <laughs> which this, this, this matrix of words just continuously births, um, that, uh, that Babylon, Athena, and Roma all represent imperial centers, imperial powers. So this is a word that uh, extends empire. And it extends a... a, a and it analyzes empire. So the, the thing, the reason they kept the secret name of Rome secret is because if you knew it, um, you would be forewarned, in a sense, as to its operation. So the other side of knowing this word is that it suggests the capacity um, to detect and understand um, these imperial energies. Uh, and so, in a way, there becomes a possibility that I alluded to with the emperor of passing beyond. Uh, I am not advocating the destruction of all structure and oh, smash the state. And I'm not advocating a worship of the state either. I'm advocating a sublimation of the energy structure of the state, uh, which basically means grow up. <laughs> Uh, and these words give us the recipe to do this. These words do not destroy Rome itself, but they, I believe, give us the ability to dissolve the otherwise opaque influence of these structures particularly the calendar uh, on our psyche so why did this come to me i feel that this is something that came to me or that i developed or whatever this has expressed itself through me because of the work i do with calendars because of my interest in moving beyond imperial mono temporal um, western counts my interest in, in changing our, our, our understanding, our semiotic of time, weaving it in with a larger picture, the Maya, for example, um, and um, opening up a whole new and radically different understanding of temporality. I believe that this formula has an ability to analyze the Roman capture apparatus in such a way that... Um, we can render it no longer toxic. Um, in my mind, this um, set of meditations lets us literally exempt ourselves from the, um, <laughs> the capture, capture apparatus itself. And so what I see, I, I remember being intrigued by this idea of the ability to just walk through walls. You know, we grow up and we, we have all these walls, we're boxed in. And I wrote a story when I was younger about growing up inside of a box and learning the ability to walk through walls. Uh, and that was how I solved the problem of the box. And um, this is, I believe, how we'll solve the problem of um, corrupt power. We will learn through walk through the walls of it. <laughs> The Amoraha Unam formula, the ritual name of Rome, whether in reality or um, simply magically, gives us that ability. So uh, this is not um, a finished work. This is uh, a, a formula that continues to grow. I've noted also that unam means oneness and amor means uh, love. So um, 
we could also look at the gematria for achad, right, which means unity, which is 13, and abba, which means love and is, um, is 13. So abba and achad are 13 plus 13 is 26, which is yod he vah the name of God, love and unity. So we also have a resonance with the Hebrew system. Um, so in all of this, and there is more, <laughs> in all of this is an extraordinary story coming from multiple different directions, a mystery and a, um, a tantalizing story about how to how to walk through the walls of the empire, how to become transparent to the world. And um, this, I believe, is an act of tikkun. Uh, when, I, when I asked whether I should produce this video, these are the cards that I drew. So I decided to go, or, go for it. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is there's more, of course. Uh, this is something that I learned the last time I, um, I taught this in a course, which was last year, and one of my students, Brian, um, said, well, I looked it up and there was an article about how <laughs> someone was claiming the secret name of Rome was, wait for it, this is just last year, Maya. Why? Because Maya is uh, the star at the heart of the Pleiades, and Rome, apparently, is built to um, the, the, the seven hills of, of Rome uh, are paired with the seven stars of the Pleiades. And uh, the hill upon which Romulus is said to have founded the city is called Maya. So this all started with the word Maya, Maya Ion. And the moment I said the word Maya Ion, uh, this process began, and these words and stories and rebuses and puzzles um, unfolded themselves into me. And so um, I've given you what I know about it, and I invite you along for the journey. Um, this is, I, I believe, the most potent arcanum that I have to offer in this course, and I offer it to you at the heart of the course, which is here in um, the path of the Empress Amor. And uh, I, I understand if you don't completely grok this all at once, because I don't completely grok this. This is extraordinary, and it uh, has a magic that is, um, is deep and mysterious and uh, wonderful. So I invite you to ponder on it, to ruminate uh, on Amoraha Unam and Maya Ion, uh, the secret name of Rome. All right, I'm Dr. Peter Deshemin, and um, this has been some exclusive content um, for my, my course and for those of you who are in my Patreon. Uh, and who have had the patience to sit through this uh, this video. But uh, I do believe that this is one of the most extraordinary formulas that um, I've ever encountered, and it has uh, extraordinary potential to change consciousness. If you, if you practice with Amoraha Unam and meditate with Amoraha Unam, it will alter your perception of time and space and power and self and... Uh, it will take you to um, extraordinary places.